Um, all right, well, we got to move on um, yeah. because we have a fantastic interview ahead for you guys, and uh, let's get it started. So, uh, joining us now is Richard Seymour. He's the author of The Twittering Machine and Ooh. a critic of what he refers to as the social industry. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I love talking about um, the impacts of the social industry, uh, especially when it comes to uh, debunking some of the messaging that so many users were fed in the early days of the social media platforms. Uh, the idea of democratizing information, the idea of how this is going to lead to uh, a better life for you. You can take charge of your own career and you can do wonderful things with the internet. But in reality, you know, you argue that to live in a digital world is to live in a, a simulacrum. And I wanted you to elaborate on that a little more. All right. Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that uh, you describe the kind of technophilic, uh, techn technophilic um, utopianism uh, of the early uh, years of the internet when everybody believed that it was going to liberate people on a very individualistic basis. Um, recently, that's become uh, the, the obverse, you know, a kind of moral panic. Um, and you saw that with the Social Dilemma um, uh, documentary, which is basically about scapegoating the, uh, the internet social industry for everything. So what I wanted to do was to try and figure out, um, first of all, you know, uh, how much is this industry responsible for? Um, and, you know, did it just invent these phenomena we call fake news, for example? Well, when was the era of unalloyed truth telling on the part of national media? You know, when did the Washington Post and New York Times not give us disinformation about Iraq or whatever? OK, um, so that's the you know, and then you think about things like trolling us actually building a longstanding cultural phenomena like social sadism um, and some of it quite harmless and actually, you know, quite amusing in some contexts. It just depends, obviously. So all the problematic aspects that we attribute to the social industry has roots in the kind of societies that we live in. And the question is, how do they then, I guess, uh, magnify and potentiate those trends? Um, so the, I mean, what I'm calling the social industry um, is essentially when this is taken over from Adorno's idea of a culture industry where, you know, culture is very homogenized because it's driven by the logic of commodification so that the plots and characters and so on that you get in mainstream Hollywood formula are very, very um, conservative, very repetitive, very stereotyped. And that tends to produce a kind of reactionary mentality, according to Adorno. What I'm arguing is actually something much, much worse in some ways um, which is that the social industry uh, is one wherein uh, our social lives have been commodified, have been subordinated to the logic of commodification. Because when we spend more time uh, communicating with one another through screens uh, than we do face to face, and that was the case well before the plague set in, um, then that has become our social lives. So what are the protocols of our social life? Um, these days and who is scripting it. Well, we know that the protocols of the social industry were drafted largely by um, and on behalf of a fairly small group of wealthy, well, usually white men in uh, Northern California, um, you know, which has its own specific class histories and its racial histories and so on. Um, so it's a fairly small subset of humanity that's decided that we need to create um, an industry that's based upon the idea of a competitive hierarchy of celebrity. Okay, so that's the crucial thing. The condition for taking part in this industry, you can use it for many useful purposes, but you have to uh, situate yourself somehow as a celebrity and you have to cultivate this personal idol you have to have your picture you have to have your uh, profile description um every bit of co uh, content that you put out has to be about cultivating that personal idol um so obviously the industry has an incentive to ensure that you're continually goaded into writing more and more and feeding it more information because the whole economic model is predicated on extracting data from you based on how you scroll, what you click through, what you write, and so on. So it becomes a system wherein the information that you're exposed to it doesn't select for accuracy in the least, certainly doesn't select for thoughtfulness uh, or you know open-mindedness or generosity of interpretation or anything like that. It selects for somatic impact. 
it's d designed to get you addicted. I mean, that's they believe that they've created an addiction machine. So the whole point is it has to hit you on a gut level. And I think anybody who's been on uh, their feeds can imagine how this works. I mean, you just have to go on your Twitter feed or whatever it happens to be that you like uh, and spend about 20 minutes on it. And chances are you'll encounter one or two or three things that will drive you nuts for the rest of the day. And the <laughs> only thing you can do, the only catharsis is to type. You've got to get typing and you've got to type as quickly as possible because the conversation moves on so quickly. And the imperative to type quickly means there's little time to think. So you get, um, you know, uh, quick fire emotive reactions uh, that are based on the, you know, the, the least charitable interpretation of something that you've seen on the internet. Um, and it's it's not surprising. The joke used to be, you know, somebody sitting up until 3 a.m., I can't go to sleep. Somebody is wrong on the internet. Well, we're all <laughs> wrong on the internet. That's that's part of the economic structure. We have to be wrong on the internet. And uh, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, Benjamin Fong and Matt Chrisman and others have said that, like, for any left to really take hold and, and and take power we all need to log off um, and you've talked about how um, you know the social industry emerged as a capitalist appropriation of the online left but w w do you buy that thesis or, or or are you skeptical of it like what do you what do you think that 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 is the social industry an antithetical to any potential left movement I'm not uh, I'm not asking people to log off for one very simple reason I haven't logged off myself. I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a petty bourgeois writer. I need to make money, so you know this. This is my audience, right? Um, so that's that's part of it. But the other thing is, um, there are some aspects of it that I find useful. What I uh, am asking us to do is to think about how it's impacting on our lives and how we can t uh, take a different relationship to it. So, uh, if we're using the um, uh, the idea of addiction to uh, understand our relationship to it. Well, if, if it is addictive, that's quite dangerous. Because if you think about it, if you're running a left-wing project and somebody says, hey, why don't you go on Fox News and talk about your left-wing project? Well, you'd be a bit skeptical. And if you did decide to go on, you'd be quite guarded. You wouldn't spill out all your secrets and you wouldn't get into a, a sort of a furious fist fight with whoever was on there. But because when we're on the social industry, there's this spurious intimacy. You know, people are talking about their divorces. They've got pictures of their kids. They're describing <laughs> how depressed they were last year. So it, you can feel like you're in an intimate, enclosed space with friends. And so you let everything out. And so that's, and that's of course, part of the whole addictive uh, mechanism. So first of all, I would suggest if we're doing something political, um, then it's 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 absolutely fine to use it. Um, indeed, you have to. That you don't really have a choice. Uh, no powerful force would uh, disown the properties of this system, and nor should we. But we should professionalize our relationship to it. We should uh, try and separate that from the ways in which people tend to use it for personal reasons. And then the other part of that I suggest is. Uh, we are obviously using it a lot for personal reasons, but we don't understand those reasons very well because addictions tend to happen behind your back. You know, it's one small decision after another small decision. They call it, uh, I mean, I always use this line, they call it the social media. I mean, this is like calling cigarettes friendship sticks. I mean, they can be used in that way, mm -hmm. but that's not what they're for. Um, and it's a bit like this. So, you you know, one one more cigarette, one more drink, and gradually this thing that was fun is beginning to exercise veto power over all other forms of enjoyment in your life so that, you know, you're sitting at your family dinner table and people are watching you scroll through your feeds and get very angry and re retort to people. That's the way it takes over your life gradually and it colonizes your lunch hours and your journeys on public transport and your, you know, sometimes your car journeys when you shouldn't and, uh, you know, it takes <laughs> over your, your meal times. This is how it works. It transforms the life that you have to live which, um, I mean, let's say... You're right. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, like the average person on the planet lives for about 71 years. I think, I, I can't remember exactly how many uh, thousand... I'm halfway hours. there. Right. Oh. But, 
But you think about that, um, the amount of time, the average amount of time that we all spend on the social industry, the average person globally, uh, is about 50,000 hours uh, in their lifetime. If you think what you could be doing with that. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not suggesting don't go on the social industry. Uh, otherwise, I would be a complete hypocrite and a liar. Um, and also, uh, you know, I've, I've got no business being sanctimonious because I've been the idiot on the social industry trolling people or harassing celebrities for saying something problematic or whatever it happens to be but we need to recognize that this is our life that is at stake here we need to take our lives seriously and to do that we need to get an executive overview of what we're doing and to say you know you know could we be doing something if not this that's the minimum utopian question we need to be asking what else could we be doing if not this According to Malcolm Gladwell, so, if you do 10,000 hours, you master a skill. So 50,000 hours, that's five oh five gosh. skills we're not mastering in our lifetime, according to Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm personally feeling uh, a lot of anxiety as you discuss this because there's a great deal of pressure uh, for everyone to be plugged into uh, the social industry. Your livelihood depends on it. And I want to I want to follow up on something that you said about, uh, you know, using the social industry for professional reasons and shying away from using it uh, from using it for personal reasons. But when you think about how this this has kind of created a culture of indi individual celebrity and Everyone needs to outdo the other. It's this competitive, um, you know, situation where uh, you're competing for likability, you're competing for celebrity, and so as a result, and this is how I've personally felt as someone who is plugged into the social industry, you have to share uh, the personal elements of your life in order to um, increase your chances of uh, that individual celebrity. Which again, I don't personally care about individual celebrity. But in the industry I work in, you literally need that in order to protect your livelihood. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. I mean, I know all about that. Um, and, you know, I've been I've been on the sort of selfie spiral where, you know, you take a picture of yourself, you get so many likes and go, God, I'm, I'm not that bad looking after all. And you, you post a whole bunch of them to get the likes um, and you become addicted. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the whole mechanism is to get you to turn your life into raw material that can be uh you know extracted as data um obviously the uh the celebrification the universal celebrification is going to um pose a number of different kinds of problems uh, at level of uh journalism and news reporting i think one of the baleful effects that it's having is that it forces um certainly the top um, layer of journalists, what in this country we call lobby journalists, so people have, who are close to power, um, they tend to um, relegate the actual rigor of reporting and analysis to um, the novelty of developing their personal icon on the social industry, because that's going to be the basis upon which they get better contracts, uh, upon which they get a de decent television show. And you see this all the time. Um, during the last general election in the UK, for example, you know, the, um, uh, some of the worst behavior by those journalists was because they were trying to come out with um, the most um, up-to-date novelty, uh, and that meant they were in very uh, manipulable by power. Now, on a lower level of analysis, and you know, not just talking about um, uh, its its impact on politics and journalism, but on an individual basis, we have to ask why is being a celebrity is so goddamn miserable? I mean, there's been innumerable studies about this, and you know, the the correlation between being a celebrity and being depressed, being self harming, engaging in suicidal behavior. I mean, it's it's through it's you know it's through the roof basically, um, and we are finding uh, now. I, I think we have to be very careful about this. There's some data talking about correlations, um, sometimes quite convincingly, between increased screen time when you're you know exposed to the social industry uh and depressive behavior and suicidal behavior and uh, self-harm and so on um and i think we should take all that very seriously now the danger is of course then we get into a kind of moral panic literature where we're just scapegoating and we're not talking about all the other things that could be making people feel a bit depressed these days you know um like climate change like rising sort of 
far right politics and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> but you can obviously see why, for example, uh, a young woman uh, or a teenage girl on Instagram um, who is constantly cultivating this personal I idol, this icon, which is not really like her, is not the kind of person she really is, but it's her living her best life, you know, her ecstatic, euphoric, and looking as sexy as she can be, or, you know, as, as attractive and glamorous as she can be, all of that stuff, which she knows is not really like her, and the gap between the person she is and the person that she's become, an, or the icon that she's become invested in, is profoundly oppressive and distressing. Um, the more you get invested in the filtered selfie and the selfie taken from above, um, the less you uh, like or admire the, the actual face that you've got. Um, so I think that already the pressures on, um, in this case, uh, you know, teenage girls, for example, were already quite significant coming from, you know, the capitals, media, you know, fashion, all, all that, all the rest of it. And I'm not moralizing about these things, but I do think we recognize these pressures. Well, uh, you can say certainly that the social industry in this instance has uh, harnessed those tendencies and magnified them and potentiated them and turned them into a constant presence um, that's so close, so intimate, because it's always in your pocket. So it's somehow both massified because it's big data and very personalized, and it gets mm. right to the heart, right to the gut. Um, so that's the danger of it. And I'm curious to ask you, because you've touched on it a little bit, um, but it's a it's a debate that is kind of raging right now, uh, both on the left and on the right, about, quote unquote, social media censorship and, you know, things like Twitter, uh, you know, uh, putting a little note next to Donald Trump's tweets saying that these are false or whatever. Um, and, you know, obviously conservatives are very up in arm about it. Some leftists are as well. Um, I I go back and forth. Uh, you know, I I, do, I also am skeptical of you know Facebook's ability to uh, censor these kind of things or like regulate speech and all that stuff. But on the other hand, I also recognize that just kind of unfettered media is also kind of problematic. And I don't know what to think. I just don't know where to where I'm landing on it. Like I have an impulse against censorship always in all cases, but I also think that. Just the kind of wild west of it, uh, of it all, um, is also problematic. And I agree with you, by the way, that like, in general, that the the social media fake news thing is overhyped. That television news is like the, the fake news that comes out of television news is undervalued. And that the biggest fake news uh, example in my life is that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> which is pre-social media. So, uh, but yeah, I just I, I've been working, I've been trying to work through these things in my head, and I just want to see what what your kind of take is on it. Um, well, I think the, the thing is, from the point of view of the social industry, you can't win. If you don't censor, then you're seen and rightly seen to be making profit out of like neo-Nazis and, and uh, fake news and, you know, conspiracy theories and so on. Uh, and if you do, it's always arbitrary. Uh, it's always based upon, um, you know, just a, a convenient political arrangement with what you what you as an executive of the social industry imagine to be the balance of forces in Washington. Um, and the reason why they can't win in that sense is because those uh, they are not the sorts of people we want to be trusting to make these decisions. Um, and therefore, we need to take that power away from them. Uh, so, for example, take the term community guidelines. Community guidelines is a term used uh, particularly by Facebook. And if you've ever mm. read, read their community, gu community guidelines document, it's an absolute mess. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't make any sense to um, anyone, particularly not to somebody who's um, an underpaid moderator, um, you know, a, a member of the digital terrorist working away in uh, Egypt or something to uh, moderate uh, content. And that's why the results are often so profoundly uh, mystifying. You know, when you report something, I just got somebody threatened threatened to murder me with an axe. Uh, this does not breach our guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the problem is these are not community guidelines. There is no community here. There should be. Uh, there should be some sort of collective control over this, but there isn't. 
what there is is a set of corporate protocols for behavior. The other side of this, another term they like to use is free speech, of course. Now, that's a more familiar uh, term, but they have a very particular relationship to it. When Twitter and so on talk about free speech, as they often do, uh, one of the things that they uh, have said traditionally is the best remedy for bad speech is good speech. So therefore, we are in favor of the, we're the free speech wing of the free speech party. Now, what they tend to mean really is, A, uh, we absolutely defend our monopoly on all content uh, on our platforms. Uh, and that monopoly cannot be challenged by regulators or by members of the public or by democratically elected governments, right? So it's about de defending their monopoly over their content. Um, second of all, uh, in the case of uh, remedy bad speech with good speech, they want, uh, you know, and they, they've actually said this, you know, they, they encourage journalists and professionals to use their platform to rebut um, the conspiracy mm -hmm. theorists. So uh, it's almost as if, you know, journalists have to go on there and do some free work uh, in order that we don't have our um, uh, infosphere polluted by this garbage. And of course, it's totally ineffectual, as you know, fact checking, you know, uh, all that stuff. It's, uh, it's even less effective than call out culture. It doesn't work. It doesn't change anybody's mind because nobody but nobody uh, who believes that uh, Pizzagate is real is going to be turned around by the Washington Post. Uh, nerdy <laughs> Actually, there is no basis for this. It's just not going to work. So um, because there's a, a, a layer to this, um, and I think this is a, a constant theme throughout the Twittering machine. Uh, there's a layer to this which is not about reason. It's not about rationality any more than it's about kind of behaviorist models of stimulus response, which is the basis of the social industry's understanding of itself, how they manipulate people. There's actually a level of human behavior, which, uh, you know, I refer to in sort of psychoanalytic terms, the unconscious. You know, it's it's not rational. It doesn't learn anything. And it uh, it's how that dimension of human experience gets hooked into this system that makes us so susceptible to uh, you know um, these kind of conspiracy theories and so on. The reason we believe them is because at some level we want to believe them, we need them to be true, and they're addictive for us. That's another thing. Um, there's a term which uh, I like to use in these contexts, it's apophenia. So if you're a member of QAnon, you're farming apophenia, you're farming this dizzying sense of, wow, head exploding, con um, uh, sort of, um, things that, you know, happened, con um, sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the term that I'm looking for here, coincidences, like, the, the, yeah. you remember um, uh, the Q guy said, how many coincidences before it's statistically impossible? Now, of course, this is nonsense, you know, but the, you, you can, like, it, I remember the experience the first time some 9-11 truther said to me, do you know that jet fuel can't melt steel beams? And of course, I later learned that this was rubbish. But you know, the point was, it's like they're lying to yeah, me. Yeah, and that's that's the kind of that's that's very addictive. The other kind of addiction, of course, is the type that Adorno talked about when he wrote about anti-Semitism, which is you know, um, and you can apply this to racism and conspiracy thinking of all types in a way, um, which is that no matter how terrifying this life world that they portrayed through their theory is. Um, it is in some sense reassuring because it's made sense of the world in some way for them. Um, mm. It's given them a yeah. place in it. Um, and of course, it's it's actually got an in, in, in it um, tendency to escalate. Um, it's a bit like pornography in that sense. They're always looking for more extreme riffs on the same basic uh, content. Um, if you want an example of this. I wouldn't know anything about that. Uh, I wasn't going to talk about <laughs> pornography. Um, if you want an example of this. Uh, it's it considered Darren Osborne. Um, Darren Osborne was an unemployed, depressed, alcoholic uh, Welshman uh, or man who lived in Wales. And uh, he um, uh, had um, not been very political until he saw a documentary, a BBC documentary about um, uh, sort of grooming gangs, uh, you know, paedophile grooming gangs in the north. And he inferred that this was happening because they, you know, these gangs were Muslims. Now, of course, 
it's a lot more complicated than that. There was all sorts of uh, factors going on here, but he wanted to interpret it in an Islamophobic way because Britain has an Islamophobic culture. So he went online and started looking at Tommy Robinson, uh, the British fascist YouTube videos and content. And it was so compulsive to him that he spent about three weeks compulsively digesting this stuff and then decided he was a soldier against Islam and he drove a van into London trying to find Jeremy Corbyn to knock him over because he believed that Jeremy Corbyn was a traitor and he was going to kill him. Uh, in the end, he drove up to Finsbury Park Mosque and plowed into people outside that mosque and managed to kill one person. But he said he wanted to kill all Muslims. He was psychically fueled for genocide. That's how compulsive and addictive this thing was. Something about his depression, and I think this is crucial, Something about his depression was turned into the motive, the animus for um, his version of a kind of jihad. And yeah. uh, I think that the way in which the social industry allows these vectors of far-right politicization, I don't think it's coincidental, by the way, that the far-right does better out of this. Um, the way in which it, uh, it, it seems to say, almost say to you, so you've got these demons that you're wrestling with. Well, here's the real demons. They're Muslims, or there's the great replacement, or uh, there's the Jews who will replace us or who will not replace us, or all of this stuff, whatever conspiracy theory it happens to be. And it's very animating, and it's, it's, it's got a sort of artificial sense of empowerment. That's really, really addictive for these people. And it, of course, you know, that's the, hence the lone wolfish aspects of it. Yeah, that's that's especially terrifying considering uh, this pandemic and how it's led to uh, depression among so many more people, especially as we're all, you know, um, staying in our homes. Uh, loneliness was already a problem. I'm sure that loneliness is skyrocketing um, under this pandemic. And so it, it kind of becomes a vicious cycle uh, because the loneliness that people are feeling, the depression that people are feeling, um, it might seem to them that it's being alleviated through the, these interactions online. Uh, but in reality, I mean, as you mentioned, and I think this is absolutely true, um, it just perpetuates more depression, more loneliness, um, and it just becomes a vicious cycle. I do want to pivot, though, uh, to talk about something that you also address, and I think it's so important for people to understand this. You know, you believe uh, that we're lab rats and wageless laborers when it comes to using the social industry or being part of the social industry. And uh, the first time I heard, uh, you know, wageless laborers was when I was reading some work by uh, Christian Fuchs, who um, mentioned the fact that we're just handing off our data um, and that data then becomes, um, you know, the bread and butter for so many of these different social media platforms. Can you elaborate on that a little more and, and talk about how uh, damaging that can be to our personal lives, really, when all this data about us, you know, we're unwittingly sharing information that's being sold to uh, third parties? Um, well, I mean, the interesting thing is I suspect most people by now kind of have some general awareness that they're that, that that's the deal. It's a kind of gift economy. You know, we'll we'll give you a tool that you can use, which will subtly manipulate you in various ways uh, in exchange for data that we're going to extract about you. Perhaps people don't know the, the full extent of it. But um, I, th I mean, when I say that we're lab rats and wageless laborers, um, I want to qualify that in one very important sense. Um, there is um, a famous experiment, you know, behaviorist experiment done with uh, rats and, you know, in terms of how they react to stimulus response, rewards and so on. And uh, this is the, you know, this is where the idea of lab rats came from. Um, the problem is that, of course, um, we are not uh, genuinely lab rats. We have uh, a much more complicated psychological structure for one, but even the rats Actually, it turned out that if you put them in different circumstances, you didn't individualize them, you left them in a social group, their susceptibility to that kind of stimulus response was greatly reduced. Um, so I think that's very important. Okay, so I just want to clarify that. Um, wageless laborers in the sense that I wanted to just underline the novelty of what's taking place here. This is not, um, you know, I mean, what kind of power structure is this? It's not, it's not a market, clearly. It can feel like a market because, of course, the whole point is we're all bidding for some sort of currency, even if that currency is attention, um, which can be monetized. 
but it's not a market. Um, it's certainly not a democracy. Uh, you know, we don't have any say, and we're not the consumers. Crucially, I mean, you know, the the, the famous uh, term is uh, that we're users, much as heroin addicts are users. Um, so uh, we are um, engaged in this system um, and uh, subtly manipulated and goaded into uh, constantly engaging with it, typing stuff in and so on. Um, now, that can have a number of obviously positive consequences in that it, it can enable us to reach people we wouldn't ordinarily reach. Um, it can enable us to find audiences that we wouldn't previously have been able to find. Uh, I can tell you, for example, I remember the days when if you went on a protest, you kind of wondered whether the news would give it like five seconds um, and if they would even tell the truth about it. Well, now you don't have to worry about that because it's going to be covered. So that's the plus side of it. But the other side is, of course, um, insofar as you're not in control of the information that you're being exposed to. And insofar as the information has been reduced to pure somatic stimulus. In other words, from the point of view of the social industry, they don't really care about the meaning of the stuff that they're feeding you. The algorithms dictate what you're gonna see based upon what they think you will react most viscerally to. Now, if you think about this, suppose you've got somebody who is um, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, ha ha regularly gets subject to racist abuse on Twitter, right? Um, one of the things they might do is respond angrily to that racist abuse. Now, as far as the system is concerned, that means that's good, they're engaging. They must love this content. Let's give them more of this content. And indeed, if you listen to the way in which the social industry talk about its users, um, they don't believe, because this is the extent to which we're really not in a democracy or a market, they don't believe that we are capable of knowing really what we want. They think that if, you know, if, if people say they want one thing, um, you better check it out and have an alpha test because only the alpha test will show what people really want. So they will go by the numbers based upon engagement. So even if the engagement is incredibly negative, even if it drives us nuts, and indeed all addictions have uh, a profoundly you know, negative um, aspect to them, that's part of the addiction. Uh, that's the death drive element, if you like. Um, well, the, the system will register that as good. That, you know, the the, um, the, the population uh, that constitutes our users uh, are engaging more. So as far as we're concerned, it's working. They like it. They love it. Um, so that's, um, first of all, that's obviously setting us up for profoundly distressing and unpleasant experiences, such as, for example, everybody probably has an experience like this. You, you say something and it's interpreted uh, as being something bad, something problematic, something against contemporary mores, and uh, people attack you for it. And then, of course, you try and defend yourself and say, that's not what I meant. But of course, on the social industry, there is no generosity. And b b before long, it's spiraled out of control. And uh, you've got 500 people you never heard of stomping on you for this thing that you said. And the more they do that, the more compulsive it is, and the more you feel like you've got to be um, you, you're, you're gripped by it, you're emotionally gripped by it, and you're professing your innocence um, typing into this uh, smartphone or whatever it is that you're using. Well, you see celebrities do that every day, of course, so, you know, whenever their fans turn on them. Um, but I think all of us do a version of this, and it is really an interesting question why it happens to be more gripping at just the points when it's turned on us and become incredibly a uh, negative and nasty experience. Um, but if we start to understand that the economic imperative of the system is it's not about informing us, it's not even really about allowing us to communicate, it's about ensuring that we engage in such a way as that we produce data about ourselves so that we can be manipulated for markets, as long as we understand that, we'll understand why our situation is so apparently helpless. So final wow. question, Richard, um, how do you see us, uh, you know, fight back against this? Like, wh what do you see as possible solutions? Uh, because one of the things, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, all, every single one of us has um, 
because all the incentives are there to engage in the toxic behavior, right? So uh, you get brownie points uh, by your own bubble, people in your own bubble, if you're uh, going after someone you disagree with and doing so aggressively. But what that does is it, it perpetuates this division where um, in reality, if you really take a step back and you look closely, there is a through line among um, the groups of people who are engaging in these uh, battles online. And that is uh, the fact that we're dealing with the ramifications of this capitalistic model, right? Uh, we're dealing with the inequality, we're dealing with all these problems, and rather than joining together in solidarity in order to fight back against it, um, it just perpetuates this division um, where we're all kind of atomized and you know in our own little bubbles not getting anything accomplished. What kind of solutions do you see moving forward, if any, to, to combat that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, the number of different ways in which uh, one could try to answer this. Um, I talk a little bit about how one might respond on an individual level uh, in the book. Um, but of course, you know, we might want to think about uh, organized solutions and ultimately political and institutional solutions. So on an individual level, I think we need to figure out, you know, if we're engaging in it um, for personal reasons, we need to figure out what those reasons are. What is the dissatisfaction that has us reaching for our phone? You know, you feel the, the, the first twinge of boredom or anxiety, you reach for your phone. What's that about? Um, and if you can really inquire, as, uh, you know, like have a conversation with somebody about that um, and work out what it is that's, uh, you know, compelling you to be on there, then you can probably take a more um, disciplined approach to your use of these media so that they're not utterly dominating you. Um, on the level of political organization, I've argued for a kind of professionalization of the relationship with uh, the social industry. But I think more importantly, um, we need to not conflate political organization with what we're doing on the internet. And I understand that some people will argue, well, look, this dichotomy between the internet and real life isn't, it doesn't hold because actually most of us are online now, billions of people are online now, and, and that's a crucial arena of political action. Well, that's true, but that's not where you're going to get your organizing done. The way in which the uh, social industry organizes you there is, it, it, first of all, it individualizes you as a series of competitive uh, accounts, um, uh, celebrities and so on. And then it serializes you so that uh, you're essentially, you're a chunk of um, information uh, sort of marching through someone's feed. Um, that's not the same thing as political organization. So obviously, um, if we are to have a chance of withstanding this, we need to build our offline, uh, if you like, political organizations. And we need to encourage people where possible, granted it's not easy at the moment, but where possible to meet with other people face to face and have the, the kinds of uh, longer and more difficult and more nuanced conversations about politics and other things too, uh, that you're not able to have on the social industry. As long as people are able to do that, they won't have their thinking utterly dominated by this industry, which does not have their interests at heart. And then of course, finally, there's the level of institutions and you know what kind of policies we need. And I'm not going to um, you know propose any magic solutions here. There are incremental steps that we can take. This is the important thing. We need intelligent mediations between where we are and where we need to be. Incremental steps would include, for example, uh, we could have a public service platform, right? In the United Kingdom, there's the BBC. Now, the BBC has all sorts of faults, but it's a public yeah. service broadcaster. It has a lot of clout and a lot of money. Were they to launch a platform, it would have some reach, and it could be used in such a way that, A, it takes power away from Facebook and Twitter and so on. B, it offers everything that they offer that's useful, but doesn't have the data extracting bits and C, isn't trying to get you hooked. So it's not trying to manipulate you. And finally, D, what it, if it had any community guidelines, there would actually be community guidelines. Some uh, community organizations uh, you know, representing the users would be regularly updating these things. So it would in some way reflect the interests of the people who were on it. That's a kind of step that we could take. We could also talk about regulations. Uh, I'm not against uh, the idea of coming up with ways to limit uh, what can be done uh, on these platforms so that the, the decisions aren't all taken by 
uh, Mark Zuckerberg or whomever. Um, because, you know, ultimately their decisions will reflect the interests of their increasingly Napoleonic business empires. Those are three different levels at which we could approach this problem. And I'm convinced also, finally, um, you know, one of the things about this that's happening uh, is that we're all writing more than we ever have written before on our tube breaks. And, you know, uh, like we've never written as much as we're writing now. Now, that's fine. As a writer, I kind of like the idea that everybody is uh, abruptly, as I say, scripturient, you know, possessed by a violent desire to write. Well, could we think perhaps about liberating that writing from this system, which makes us write in such short bursts of uh, distemper? Maybe we could think about other ways in which we could write and ways which we would enjoy more and which would enable us to be a bit more creative and reflective and which would be a bit more satisfying for us. Um, those are the things that I would encourage people to think about. Well, Richard Seymour, thank you very much. This was very enlightening, uh, very bracing for me. I mean, we're, we're all in it. You know, we're all part of it, especially people who work in, in this business. So thank you so much for taking the time uh, speaking to us. This was an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, you know, I'm going to share it with all my Twitter and Instagram addicted friends. Everyone check out uh, Richard's book as well. Um, he's the author of The Twittering Machine. Um, and this is really important material since, yeah, uh, Nando's right. This impacts all of us. Um, Richard, thank you again. And hopefully you'll join us again soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much.